Okay, everybody, thanks very much, and uh, maybe a minute or so late, but uh, there's a lot of great discussion in the room here after the first session, and that's what we like to encourage here at the Weather and Climate Summit. And uh, certainly, I wanted to acknowledge the um, organizers of the Weather and Climate Summit, uh, Jim, Dr. Jim White from University of Colorado, uh, Dale Eck uh, from the Global Forecast Center at the, the Weather Channel, uh, Dave Sweeney, uh, who is not here with us uh, today, uh, but I think he's uh, watching the live stream. We miss you, Dave, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come out here next year. But uh, And myself, uh, Dave Jones, we're part of the organizing committee, or we are the organizing committee, along with Breckenridge. And um, we, we spend all year trying to put together uh, great sessions that will bring phenomenal speakers. And uh, we'd love your input as well, those of you watching online, uh, whether you think uh, things have gone well and uh, certainly we're getting uh, all your comments. Sarah Maxwell, uh, who's a meteorologist and also works at Storm Center Communications, is uh, monitoring all the social media. Uh, she's also uh, telling us uh, things that you bring up uh, online, and we're trying to address them uh, you know, as soon as we can. Uh, also, uh, Dave Stroud and uh, Robert uh, Freeland are working the production uh, component, so behind the cameras and the production system. So. Uh, without uh, all of those folks, uh, this never would have happened. And also, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, I Image Audiovisuals uh, from Denver, Colorado. Uh, they uh, uh, put together uh, all of the technology that you see here, the lighting, uh, the monitor here, uh, the uh, cameras that we're using. So they're out of Denver, Colorado, and we really do appreciate your help there. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Bob Rutledge from the Space Weather Prediction Center. I got to tell you, space weather uh, and space weather issues are really uh, ramping up uh, very rapidly uh, for uh, on the radar screens of organizations like FEMA uh, and uh, NOAA's operational organizations because uh, we have satellites up there orbiting from uh, in space uh, that are very vulnerable to space weather uh, events, and also down here, all of us here are doing social media in the room, and we're also. Uh, trying to tw uh, tweet and uh, post things on Facebook, social media, uh, that all requires a network, and that gets impacted by space weather. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce a short video uh, to bring you up to speed about the importance of space weather, and then we'll get right into uh, Bob's presentation. And uh, so let's take a look at that video. <laughs> Technology. It's the rhythm of our everyday life. We're more dependent on satellite and communication systems than at any other time in history. Disruptions can affect our economy and even our safety. To prepare for the effects of such events and minimize impacts, we need to look outside our atmosphere, some 93 million miles away at a star we call the Sun. It's our main energy source. It warms the Earth and grows our food. While the Sun and the space between may seem pleasant from our perspective, it's anything but peaceful. At its surface exists a chaotic state of eruptions and radiation. And unlike Vegas, what happens at the sun doesn't stay at the sun. Space weather is essentially emissions from the sun, uh, radiation, magnetic field that erupts from the solar surface, pumped out into space, sometimes right towards the Earth. When it impacts the Earth, it impacts our technology. That's what we call space weather. These solar events and their effects at Earth can disrupt systems we take for granted. From causing blackouts to the power grid, to delaying offshore drilling operations due to inaccurate GPS data. Interference with communication systems can force air traffic to reroute and impact rescue response and coordination. Outside our atmosphere, solar radiation can harm astronauts and the systems they depend on. The good news is that these eruptions can be detected early. Forecasters at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado, have their eyes on the sun at all times. <laughs> 
The Space Weather Prediction Center is part of the National Weather Service and is very much like a normal weather forecast office. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're looking at data, we're looking at imagery, we're looking at model outputs. As conditions develop, we put out alerts, warnings, and watches of imminent activity to our customers so they can take action. In many ways, forecasting space weather is a lot like forecasting hurricanes. Those who rely on space weather forecasts, like electric power grid managers, are informed early on and can begin taking protective action. When we see an eruption on the sun, space weather forecasters will issue a watch. This is much like a hurricane watch. When a hurricane sits offshore of Miami, for example, perhaps 48 hours out, we too can see way in advance that something may be coming towards the Earth. As the storm moves toward us, it hits a monitoring spacecraft orbiting a million miles away from Earth. It's kind of our, our buoy sitting out there offshore and that hurricane about 30, 45 minutes before it makes landfall, we'll get the measurements from the buoy. That's what the spacecraft does for us. That big eruption that left the sun, hits the spacecraft. Now we've got the measurements of exactly what's going to impact us here on Earth. And we issue the warnings to give the power grid a heads up that the storm is now imminent. An interesting element to this whole process is that when the forecasters issue the alert, the power grid receives the alert, takes the necessary actions to protect the grid, the average citizen never knows anything ever happened. The number of customers who rely on space weather information continues to grow. As our reliance on technology increases, so will our need for constant monitoring of the sun. Um, I'll have some mixed in today, so we'll make those presentations available. Um, and a lot of great groundwork laid for me there in a lot of the things we'll be talking about. So um, it is the sister center essentially to the Hurricane Center. Um, I enjoyed the, the discussion this morning. I think I'll be able to draw some parallels. You already saw a few uh, there about the state of what we know when and how much we can tell you. And we also have our own set of, uh, you know, semantics issues and limitations in the products and, and how we convey information. So I'd love to stand here today and tell you we've got it all solved. Uh, we unfortunately do not, but we understand where the needs are and we're working hard to, uh, to close those gaps. So I've got about an hour and 15 minutes. That's a lot. I think we could uh, dedicate the whole week to space weather. Um, it's not practical to do that. And actually, throughout this talk, I don't expect you to take everything away from this. And there are things that you will hear today that you probably never have to hear again. Uh, but I want to put it all on the table so that you know you know, what do you have to pay attention to and what can be ignored? Because I think there's a lot of misconceptions with space weather and, and the things that go with it. And sometimes I think there's a, uh, more fear than necessary in some elements. And so that's, that's one of our key goals is to make sure we're getting, you know, reasonable information out there and, and so people know what to do with that. So it does all start with the sun. So I'll go through the background of the sun. If, if you look at a, from a climatology perspective, looking at the long-term evolution of the sun kind of tells us what our seasons are going to be. You know, unlike the uh, hurricane season, for example, where you, you get a fresh one every year, ours is a little bit longer, you know, with roughly on average 11 year from uh, maximum activity to minimum. So we'll go through that. I want to walk through the sequence of events. You know, what plays out? How does this play out? And what do we know when? Because it, it really drives the limitations on how much information we can give our customers and at what time, time scales. We'll walk through kind of our attempt at the, the model of the Saffir Simpson or Fujita scale, although. I'll point out the weaknesses there um, across the, the three major different phenomena and talk about really the impacts and some examples of impacts. And I'll talk about how the technologies have, have changed. So if you look back in history, 100 years ago, um, despite from effects on telegraph systems, maybe sightings of the aurora, uh, you know, mankind was generally uh, insensitive to space weather. But as I sit here with my, my, my iPhone, the car driving up here, the GPS prevalent in everything we do, Technology has become more ingrained in, in day-to-day lives. <coughs> and I think space weather can affect that in many ways. And I'll talk about some of the changes we have on the horizon uh, to describe this. So space weather is really three pieces. And it's important. It kind of goes back to Physics 101. 
but it's important to keep these straight so that we understand which, which of these three phenomena affect um, you know, what at different time scales. So if, if you start at the sun, the first piece we'll talk about is electromagnetic radiation. So we're talking about radio waves and light. So unlike the charged particles we'll talk about later that see the magnetic protection from the Earth, uh, this light, just like the sunlight shining outside, doesn't, doesn't know, can't see the, the magnetic field of the Earth and affects the sunlit side and, um, of the Earth. The next piece, as I said, is the uh, charged particle environment. So we talk about the, the many atoms and electrons and, and protons that are at the sun. And these massive explosions can accelerate those to large fractions of the speed of light. So they make that 93 million mile trip I in tens of minutes. So they then have the energy to pass through satellites, humans in, in space, as you saw in the video, um, and can give those systems trouble. The last piece is, is the one kind of illustrated by this loop protruding from the sun here, and that's when a, a large portion of the outer atmosphere of the sun is explosively blown into space. That's called a coronal mass ejection. We have our host of acronyms and, and fancy terms, but that's the CME. Um, but just think of that as a superheated billion-ton cloud of plasma. And it has its own magnetic field, so it can essentially slam into Earth with the graphical depiction here and affect Earth's own magnetic field. And that really drives some of the major phenomena that we worry about. So the sun, essentially on the, uh, on the right, you see what it looks like uh, today or yesterday, rather. Um, you can see that we do have some, some spots. And uh, that's really, in the absence of spots, in general, we don't have much of a source for significant space weather. So uh, the sun is playing along with me just a little bit. It's giving me something to talk about, although it's not um, you know, terribly significant. But there is some potential, uh, anytime you get a region on the disk, to have it produce some activity. And I'll show examples later on, but a lot of times we get this. This is where we sit, and then it's kind of a watch and wait game as we watch how that region evolves and does it or does it not. Um, produce any activity. On the left is what the sun looked like in uh, late 2003, in October, the Halloween storms. And you can see those are uh, very large sunspots and uh, very significant. So that, that's a pretty easy forecast to make. As those rotated around, as the sun rotates from our perspective in about 27 days, we saw those rotate from left to right, and we were able to, to raise that situational awareness, bring those forecast probabilities up as we saw those coming on. I want to replay it one more time and draw your attention uh, to something pretty amazing under the cursor. You'll see, essentially, we go from an area that is blank to an enormous sunspot in about 72 hours. So, so in this case, it didn't affect anything. There were other significant sunspots on the disk bringing those probabilities up. But there are times where we get the one sunspot emerges in three or four days, and we get frustrated customers to say, why didn't you tell us last week, and we're just, we're just not there. I mean, there are people working on some pre-eruptive signatures, uh, but we really don't have it. We kind of have to wait until we see it uh, with the sun. So I won't, I won't go into it today, but I did want to offer this link. A lot of great resources out there, um, and as I said, sometimes a picture or a movie is worth um, you know, more than me talking about it for 10 minutes, but the sun is really amazing. It is essentially if you, if I had a basketball in my hands and uh, I gave one of you a BB and asked you to stand on a basketball court, for example, and you were standing under one hoop and I was under the other, that's the relative sizes of essentially the sun and the earth. So we're, we really are a tiny speck, um, and the sun is, is really absolutely enormous, amazing, and, and extremely powerful. And, and when it it acts up and, and manifests itself in ways that can affect our technologies. It really is. It's awe-inspiring for me. It's, it's a little bit surreal. You look outside and it's sunny or it's not. But then when you start to look at the sun in a different way, there's a lot more to it. So again, beyond what I can go into today, but, but that link is available and a great um, NASA resource there. So in the long term, we do have uh, long seasons where activity uh, rises and falls. For the sun, as I said, unlike normal terrestrial weather, it's about an 11-year average. So what you see here is the, the current sunspot cycle on the left. You can see it's plotted up through, um, through last month, or through this month, and uh, you can see the red line. So the red line is essentially the prediction of what we think is going to happen. And I have some bad news for everybody in the crowd, and that is that we're not very good at it. So about six years ago, we brought in the 20 greatest solar physicists in the world, essentially, locked them in a room, we had uh, 
couple press releases ready to go to say, is solar cycle 24 going to be a big one or is it going to be a small one? And we waited and waited kind of as my colleague Bill Murta, who showed up there, says waiting to see the, you know, the white smoke or the black smoke for the election of the Pope. And they came out and essentially they put out a prediction with two graphs on it. Very, you know, almost a negligible value to our customers when the community as a whole says we can't agree whether it's going to be uh, to big, big or small. So that, that actually uh, went out there for a while with two curves. Uh, we now believe after they a prolonged, uh, longer than expected uh, period of, of little activity, we, we move those curves again to the right 18 months, and then we've settled on the lower one. And you can see the blue line is kind of the running average. We're not really, we're not really making it there so far. Uh, so this solar cycle, you know, in all intents and purposes, is turning out to be a dud so far. But a couple important messages to come on that, so I don't want you to get too much of a false sense of security there. So we, we may revise that as this goes on. We start to get better indicators as the solar cycle starts to play out. But the, the point being, and we get uh, messages to say, you know, the, the solar cycles are going to disappear, or, or the absolute opposite, that the next one is going to be the one, you know, that brings society to its knees. So take that all with a grain of salt. To be quite frank, we don't know. But we're working very hard on it. A few decades down the road, we'll know who was right. But for, for the time being, we have to wonder. So also, um, just looking back to the, uh, back from 1900 to present, you can see that there's some, you know, some of those cycles are, are half as big as, as the others. These are sunspot numbers. So this is on average about how many of those spots are there. And, and that's the maximum observed on those days throughout the time. If, if I pull up this graph, and don't worry too much about what it is, but think of these lines and the height of these lines as being representative of severe geomagnetic storms. And I'll define that a little better later. But you can kind of see that cycle superimposed there. But going to the next part, and a little bit of a confusing graph here, but if you look, that starts at 1934 in the top, top here, and it shows the uh, solar cycle 17 through the present. And essentially those, again, those tall bars, very big one I'll talk about later in 1989, for example, March of 1989. And I think the point that I want you to, to take away from this is that you can't really see that perfect cycle here. The message being that the big ones can come at any time. And, and to draw on an analogy from the Hurricane Center, it could be a less than average year overall, but if it's the year you get the Cat 5 um, you know, making landfall on the East Coast, that's a, that's a very significant year. So we're, we're a bit in the same boat with respect to, to severe space weather. Wow. Yes? That's right. We uh, also have a lot of limitations to our our climatology, and we don't have a great paleoclimatology record to look back through. What we do have is uh, magnetic observatory measurements since about the mid-1800s, um, quite good from the 40s and on, although a lot of that data is hard to use today for studies because it's not digitized, uh, for example. The other thing that we have is uh, sightings of the aurora. So that's one of the, the beautiful things that happens when we get these, and you can look back through records of mariners kept phenomenal records of how far south was the aurora observed. So you can kind of pull on that as a proxy, and that will also come up as a great lead-in to my next slide or two of some of the, the ways we assess those, those magnitudes is just looking back at the proxies like aurora. So this again goes back uh, to 1750, uh, so reasonable numbers of sunspot observations. So since the time of Galileo, people taking a, an observatory and projecting a picture of the sun onto a piece of paper and literally just drawing those spots. And so that gives us a good way to keep track of that overall activity. You can see again, uh, the, the red dash line there is about average. So as of late, you know, since the space age, we've been above average. Um, but um, once you take a look at the uh, cycle that uh, two cycles circled there, those were ones that housed the 1859 event, which is essentially, not to overuse the analogy, but the Katrina of space weather, it's been called in the 1921 storm, another phenomenal geomagnetic storm, and you can see those came from less than average cycles. So again, going back, uh, it's, it's do we catch the big one at the right time, is it, and is it headed toward Earth? So there's no, just, just to be clear, no causality imp implied there. It's really just, you know, almost like earthquakes, uh, the big ones can be random, even though the numbers on average can, can be less and will vary with this cycle. So again, as I said, the great lead-in, uh, how do we know? Um, Aurora, for that 1859 storm, reports of campers in the Rocky Mountains getting up 
starting to cook breakfast because they thought the sun was rising. So phenomenal. And um, I can't imagine really without the understanding that we have today looking up and seeing the sky red. So you see this also interwoven back through historical records of, of, of signs and omens and the, you know, the sky being on fire. But um, lots of records to look back. Also in 1921, for example, caused uh, railway system problems within New York City. So since the, the 18, 1859, when that, that Carrington flare was observed on September 1st, uh, Richard Carrington was actually sitting in his observatory uh, in London, saw whitening on a piece of paper, and about 18 hours later, they observed intense geomagnetic storms. So the sequence of events. As I said earlier, really it all does start with the sunspot. So these are the same sets of slides from late October. So as I said, it was a it was a reasonably easy forecast to kind of bring everybody's situation awareness up to say, hey, we have the potential. But really, at this point, when we can see the sunspots, we can see the magnetic fields underlying those sunspots, watch how they're changing, watch how complex they are, we can make probabilistic forecasts. But the moment before we get that, that solar flare, that massive release of energy, that explosive event, we, we can't tell you. So when it all does start with magnetic fields, and I'm going to draw on this a couple times, but if you think about two bar magnets, and you take those opposite ends, and you push them, it's, you can't really push them together. They, they're perfectly happy to, to kind of repel each other. You flip those magnets around and get the, the like ends, the opposite ends together, and you'll get that snap back, that, that reconnection. That's essentially what we have on a solar flare. Is it's magnetic fields that underlie the sun that are um, protruding through the surface, manifesting themselves as sunspots, and then explosively reconnecting. So once we get that, that event um, illustrated in that, that panel, uh, this is shown from the GOES spacecraft, the X-ray data. That's really our first sign that we've had a big event and that we should start watching for the other two big phenomena, which is the radiation storm, that acceleration of those particles um, that essentially appear to after, after we get the storm going an hour into it. Essentially, if you were in space, night side of the Earth, day side of the Earth, it doesn't matter. They appear to be coming at you from every direction in space. They give astronauts on the space station a hard time, also satellites in orbit. And then the, the last piece, the piece on the right here, is that coronal mass ejection piece. So in the red panel there, a nice example of that not headed towards Earth. So if you look at the white circle, a couple different views here, but that's essentially where the sun would be if you could see it. We've created an artificial eclipse so we can see the atmosphere compared to the bright portion of the sun itself. So the scarier scenario for me and my customers is, is shown in the, the blue panel here. Not yet, I guess, so you'll get it in the big view. But essentially, when it comes directly at you, it looks like a halo. It's like you know, staring into an, an oncoming train. So this is that sequence event. So you get the explosion. Uh, this is a detector in space. You'll start to see the snow. Those are really those charged particles, that radiation passing through and depositing energy. And there, then here is the, the big CME. Again, it looks like a halo. It's coming straight at you. And it starts to, um, that's our first indication. Once we get that sequence of events, it really kicks us into high gear. So when, when we observe that, that big event, we start watching for, for those images, those chronograph images, to see, did it have a CME? And if it did, was it directed at Earth? We also have a couple views from satellites off to the side that, that help us constrain you know, how wide was it versus how fast it was going. With that single picture head on, there's an ambiguity between how wide it is and how fast it's going. But we've made uh, great strides in that. We can, from there, plug it into our first large-scale physics-based model. This is the WSA Enlil model. And if I haven't used enough confusing terms, we're now mixing acronyms and Enlil being the Sumerian god of the wind. So I guess if you spend your life developing a model, you certainly get the, uh, the option to name it. Um, but we certainly keep everybody on our toes keeping up with this. So what you're seeing here is essentially looking down, uh, the yellow dot, looking down on the top of the sun, the north pole of the sun. And we see that, that uh, CME or that transient put in there. And what this allows us to do is really narrow down arrival time. So although space is largely a vacuum, it's running into to other parts of the solar wind that's always coming off of the sun and it may be slowing down. So this really has helped us. So before this, we were probably on the order of plus or minus 16 hours on arrival time. And I think with this model, with the observations, we've come down to about plus or minus seven. So huge, huge gain for us. The, uh, 
was already mentioned, but uh, Bill Murtaugh described that we get to know that an event is coming, but we never get to make, using the hurricane analogy, that pressure or wind speed measurement until it crosses our rowboat, you know, 50 miles off the coast of Florida or Louisiana. And that's the ACE spacecraft. So we take that 93 million mile gap, and we have a, a spacecraft a million miles upstream of Earth. And you might ask, why can't you put it farther, get twice the time? They're trying with solar sail technologies, uh, but a lot of it's just driven by, by orbital mechanics. That's a sweet spot where the sun and the Earth are kind of pulling equally on that spacecraft so it can sit there. And that's kind of our upstream buoy, and it's a, a single point of failure. Started taking data in 97, so it's well past its lifetime, but I'm, I'm happy to, to say that we have partnered with NASA, the U.S. Air Force, and secured a replacement for that and launched in late 2014. So you'll, you'll see it when we walk through the geomagnetic storm process, but essentially this is where we got to see, going back to those magnets again, is what, what's in that cloud. If that cloud is, is lined up the same direction as, as Earth's own magnetic field, they're pretty happy to sit there um, right beside each other without strong reconnection. You flip that around, put those opposite ends of those magnets together, you get very, very strong storming. So details of the data assigned, essentially we look at that red line there, is that orientation of that magnet. We say, okay, is it flipped? And if so, how strong is it? And that's when we really start to be able to make you know, better statements with higher confidence about what could be expected. And then in the end, we observe this in many ways, both with satellites, um, but our, our products are driven off of the host of ground-based magnet magnetometers and magnetic observatories um, across the world. So when these, this uh, CME slams into the Earth and creates lots of large currents, uh, it shows up in, in ground magnetometers, and we can see how disturbed uh, really is it. So as I said, the, uh, I saw where I gave this briefing earlier. It was the, the FEMA ops room that showed up in the Hurricane Center briefing. Uh, but this is the, uh, the briefing I gave on July 11th. So just out of practice, so that we're ready, when and if needed, we brief FEMA once a month. A lot of times it's just a status, just a comms check. Uh, but in, in early July, we had this region. It doesn't look, in size-wise, that much different than what I showed you for today. But underlying this, when we looked at magnetically, it was really quite complex, and it was moving a lot and changing a lot, so we thought it had good potential. And, and I think the words I used in the FEMA briefing was, was essentially that this region deserves some respect and that you should have a heightened sense of operational awareness uh, with this region. That said, I also had to make the caveat that it can also make this whole trek across the visible disk and not do a thing, and that's exactly what it did. Um, but you can see the, the next image on July 23rd here. It got about five days behind what we'd call the limb over here, the sun. We're out of view, and it had a, a fantastic explosion. And so this is, this is where this, this is a uh, diagram of where these stereo spacecraft are. So these are spacecraft launched by NASA and they named them intuitively, get the cursor back, stereo ahead is the red dot, and stereo behind, and so they're slowly getting ahead and behind, respectively, about 20 degrees per year, but it gives us a great multi-angle view um, of this event. So this is what was seen from stereo ahead. So this is the perfect scenario in my business because it was obvious. So if it would have been Earth-directed, the speeds on this were phenomenal, one of the fastest CMEs ever observed. So that's easy for me. I get to go essentially all in on this one without having to think too much about it. So I would have gotten on the phone with the procedures they stand today. We would have gotten on the phone with, with NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. So think of that as the industry body responsible for the reliability of the power grid. So that would have been the first call we would have made is to, to get them on the phone, to let them know that, hey, we know something is, is coming. We can't tell you whether this is the once a, in a decade storm at this point or if it's that Carrington event, that once in a hundred years. But we're telling you all we know, and that's that you need to pay more attention um, given what's coming this way. And the call that would have followed that would have been to FEMA. So FEMA from a, a response and recovery perspective, uh, but really industry for the power grid are the ones with their fingers on the controls. So it's really a government and largely a you know, some government generation transmission in the power industry, but a government and, and private partnership there to make sure everyone is doing the right things to, to make sure that our infrastructure um, is maintained as well as it could be. So how do we, how do we say too much about this storm? And, and again, going back, I pointed out that red trace, that's that magnet, and, uh, you know, is it flipped and how strong is it? 
So if you look back, if you look at this red trace, essentially that's that, that magnet. And it's flipped opposite, and it's very strong. So minus 40, minus 50 there is very strong in terms of this measure. I lay it next to, I want you to, to pay attention to the green trace. For example, that was the Bastille Day storm back in, in 2000. And so this graph, the mysteriously disappearing graph, bear with me. So this graph is, is what resulted from that 2000 storm. So we're pegged at our cat 5 there. That KP of 9 is our cat 5. And we do have, I'll go ahead and fess up now, there's a limitation. So unlike a, you know, a cat 5 hurricane, every once in a while in our business, we get one with 500 mile an hour winds. So there's some saturation to that scale. They're not all created the same. So I don't want to imply too much by this, but this is a very strong storm uh, that resulted in essentially pegging out our scale of, of geomagnetic storms. So again, the sun hasn't been very active. Going back to the point that, you know, we haven't had many events, but all it takes is that one. We were just fortunate in this case that it wasn't pointed at us. So this is, as I described, the, uh, the space weather scales. Um, so it's, a, it's an eye chart here, but I, I provide it for reference. So if there's one page to kind of decode what we mean with space weather and how we get on the same terms with respect to language, it, it will come from this chart. So again, the radio blackouts, the solar flares, um, there's a category from one to five, from minor to extreme. And then in this middle column that where the bulk of the text is, it kind of gives generalities about what could the impacts be. And really, before we start to observe, because even, even going back to the hurricanes, um, you know, a cat three um, on a geomagnetic storm isn't always the same. I mean, you could see stronger GPS impacts, for example, on certain you know, G2 level storms. So there, there is some limitation, it's, but it's a broad brush, and to our ability to predict them, it's, it's as, as well as we can do. So the, just a real quick, the radio blackout is, again, x-rays, so that's light reaching, reaching the Earth in, in eight minutes. There's the radiation storm, so these are, are protons and energies. Um, so essentially, again, lots of funny terms, lots of units that we, it really makes it difficult to convey to people. Uh, but to give you an example, this green line here, 100 MeV proton. So just think of that as really fast. So that proton is moving at about 43% of the speed of light. So when you go really fast, you can go through lots of things. So think about satellites, humans in space. Uh, but again, our, our scale itself is, is driven off of the red line, which is still a significant impact to satellite systems. And then the geomagnetic storm scale. So the, again, we, ha we always have a value. Every three-hour period has a value. We're always running at one, twos, threes, fours. And then we start to get into our storm scales. The, where the analogy to the hurricanes breaks down or the Saffir Simpson or Fujita is that across most of these scales, these level one, level two storms are not truly significant. We have to get into kind of our category three before it starts to, to really make a difference. And so that's, that's a limitation. There, is, there isn't a category one hurricane that's negligible, but there certainly are a lot of category one geomagnetic storms, radiation storms that you just kind of sweep under the rug. So there's a, a scaling problem there just to be aware of. Again, a bit of a, we got into this earlier, this is how we use them, um, the semantics of how we use watch warning and alerts. And so thankfully I'll, I'll walk through what's available for, for each of our products, but the watches are kind of our longer term, lower confidence. We only have those for the geomagnetic storm scale. The warnings we reserve for very short-term high-confidence um, events, and then alerts means we're observing uh, that the conditions have exceeded the threshold. So just to dive into the solar flare piece uh, just a little bit more, again, to reiterate what I said, so this is eight minutes. These are photons or packets of light or radio waves, um, and this really throws people off. You never, ever want to, unless you want to get thrown out of a room and say, like, wave-particle duality or something like that. But it, it's just, it's, a, it's radio waves and it's light and it affects the sunlit side of the Earth. So again, we don't know the moment before it happens that it's gonna happen, but we do have probabilities. So as we see lots of regions with potential, we'll start ramping those probabilities up. When this happens, you can see these jump orders of magnitude, looking at this graph down here, orders of magnitude on a very short time scale. So we don't have a lot of products. We essentially say when we've crossed our R2, that category two threshold, we issue an alert to say, hey, an event is in progress. What will happen next for our critical customers is they'll start looking at the upper right here. So this is high frequency communication. So those of you that aren't familiar with, with HF, essentially it's very useful 
for communicating in remote areas. So UHF, VHF radios are generally line of sight. So if I'm flying over an airplane over Colorado, for example, there are plenty of people within my line of sight that I can talk to on the ground. But as soon as I go out over the Gulf, out over the Pacific, the Atlantic, I lose those ground stations. So then I start to rely on satellite communications and HF radio. So it's, it's highly used both for data and voice communication in the airlines and in the op center, for example, that is responsible for communicating traffic to the airlines out over the Atlantic, Pacific, you will see this graphic running in their op center. So when we get an event, essentially what will happen is the layer that that signal can normally, that signal will go up and bounce off a higher layer of the ionosphere. What happens is these x-rays penetrate, ionize the D layer, which sits between that reflective layer. Essentially, you, you get absorbed before you ever get a chance, chance to bounce. So that's why, again, it's a communication problem. We call this our D region absorption product. So, I mean, you lose a lot of people right there. If you could call it in plain language, you know, an HF blackout product or something like that, I think you reach a lot more people. Thankfully for us, our HF communities are probably some of our savviest user groups, so they don't struggle with that. Uh, but when you go to communicate these in, in broad terms, we do, we do struggle with some of the artifacts of our terminology. I think it is a different physical phenomena. Um, I will point out another radio impact in a little bit um, that is essentially a noise source. So there are several, several processes at work, but this one is, is kind of unique in the D region ionization. So as I said, this is largely um, an impact to certainly the, the ham radio community. Um, emergency managers use this sometimes as a secondary or tertiary means of communication. Uh, but the biggest, again, is, is the aircraft. So this was from March of uh, last year. We had a reasonable round of, of space weather activity. It wasn't historically significant by any stretch, but we kind of got into that 2-3 range where we start to see real tangible impacts. And what happened was they lost contact with an aircraft on its way from Vancouver to Tokyo. So those operators right away want to, to know is it the environment that's causing me not to be able to reach that aircraft, or is it, have we lost an aircraft? You know, minutes count in these disasters. So if there's a real problem with an aircraft, they want to rule the environment out right away so they can dispatch search and rescue. So that's exactly what happened. They, they could make sense that it was like the environment. It wasn't the only aircraft occupied, but they reached kind of the first threshold in the FAA alerting phase is to say we're uncertain about the health and safety of this aircraft. So certainly a very significant impact, and they take, take that very seriously. Here's the other phenomena that I um, spoke about just a moment ago. So these are GPS receivers. Green is good. You've got a good signal. You're locked. You've got a position. So this is from a, a network. This is a, a product from uh, Cornell University. But essentially what I'm going to show you is that for a brief period of time, and this was in December of 2006, the sun created essentially a noise source that was so overwhelming that the GPS receiver on the ground couldn't pick out that GPS signal in spite of all the noise from the sun. So we'll play this through here. So you can see it, it runs along pretty well. Start to get these big solar flares creating lots of radio noise. And guess what? Not to get into the technical details here, but this polarization and this frequency essentially says it looks just like a GPS signal. So the other hard part of the, the business for us is uh, this isn't repeatable flare to flare. In December 2006, was a, this was the first good example we had of that. And we saw it again in 2011. We had a sequence of three flares, for example. The first one was pretty big, no impact. The second one, not quite as big, and it had a strong impact on, on this GPS frequency. And then the third flare had no component. So we're really struggling with this, but uh, I always present it so that people who depend on GPS for safety of life applications um, are aware that GPS has its limitations. And you'll see this again when we get to the geomagnetic storm piece, but uh, not a big deal if I'm driving up here from, from Boulder. You know, my GPS goes away on 70. I don't suddenly jerk the wheel to the right. But if you're landing, for example, low visibility coming into Aspen or something like that, and you're relying on GPS and you lose it for that wrong 10 minutes, very, very serious. So uh, I'll come back to that when we talk about the, uh, the FAA's wide area augmentation system to make GPS better, but uh, just be aware. 
So the next piece, again, there's a link there to a great NASA resource. Um, if you want to go back, I don't want to go too far into depth with this, but when we start talking about where are the impacts from radiation storms, you have to, to make sense a little bit of what kind of protection are you getting from the Earth. So think of the Earth as essentially as a bar magnet. Um, and what I'll show you later how this, this works, but essentially that, that center of the Earth magnetically is different than it is geographically. So it's tilted by 11 and a half degrees, as it's stated here, and offset by several hundred kilometers. So essentially, the, the, one of the, the main takeaways from this is that at the equator, you get a lot of protection from the magnetic field. But at the poles, you can see these are freely open to space. So a lot of times when we get radiation storms, these particles can essentially come in at the poles, and that's why those, those impacts are centered there. So again, beyond what we need to get into today, but just kind of for that, that big picture. So the radiation storm, we get that big event. If it's a, a great big flare that happens clear over here on the limb, we're probably not going to see a strong radiation storm, and we won't see it as well as when it's lined up, essentially, dead center, or even for reasons kind of as you going back to that spiral as the material, it's almost like a garden sprinkler. It, it's dead center and a little bit right of center, so to speak, are really good places when we get a big event to get big radiation storms at Earth. So again, these are, are protons primarily that are accelerated. Um, this is a three-day plot in the middle. So you essentially see they come up orders of magnitude on the terms of tens of minutes. But the difference between that, that flare that lasts you know, for 90 minutes at most, a couple hours in the worst of cases, these come up and stay up for days. And what you also see here is probably something I haven't talked about yet. A lot of times when you get a region, it doesn't just produce one event. It can repeat, it can be multiple producers all the way across the disk. So when you get a very active region, you could sit there for two weeks and have elevated radiation levels the whole time. So this does pour in at the poles. So this is a polar view. It might be a little bit hard to see, but you see that red splotch. And essentially, just like that day side high frequency communication, a little bit different physics at work, but it's essentially blacked out the use of HF radio on the poles. And that's very important because of the graphic albeit a little dated in the bottom right, and that's the advent of the polar routes. So back in 2000, they opened up Russian airspace to polar routes. It's the fastest and cheapest way to get to Asia from the U.S. So chances are if you flew to you know, Beijing tomorrow, you would go over the pole. So there, again, no one on the ground to talk to there, so they're relying on HF. The other trick now is that many aircraft are, are equipped with satellite communication. But if you get high enough in latitude, you can't see those geosynchronous satellites. So ab above about 82 degrees, you can no longer, because of the curvature of the Earth, see, see the geosynchronous satellites. So if you live at the North Pole, direct TV is out for you. You're on your own. You can't see it. But so that's why they have to have HF. They don't have that satellite as a backup. And there are Iridium satellite phones, for example, that are visible, and those are making their way into aviation. They've been approved for use. Uh, but essentially, this is what we've lived with to date. So some of the challenges, this is again going back to March. I had a phone call with United Airlines. One of our, our big customers, certainly an image courtesy here of, of Mike Stills from United. And it was uh, about a polar flight they were prepping. And uh, essentially, we're sitting right there. I blocked out the right-hand side. You guys can probably guess what happens. But I get the decisional support call. What's going to happen? And in our business, we have a hard enough time of predicting the, the phenomenon itself, let alone the impacts. So essentially all I could say at that point, and this region had, had, it was decaying, it was getting smaller, it was getting less complex, it hadn't had you know, big flares. I said, but it's still there, and it, it still has the potential. And I said, as soon as I hang up this phone, just to spite me, the sun will probably light us up. And so what happened? Of course, 30 minutes, no kidding, after I hung up the phone, we got another big event and it brought those radiation levels back up. So I made that phone call back, and I said, hey, um, you know, Murphy's at work, and we have another event. And uh, he said, great, I made the right decision based on the decisional support information you gave me that that threat was still there, that I put more fuel on that plane, and I can, I can handle that route going further south now because they've got to come off the poles when those radiation levels come up. But it's just to speak to the challenges of getting people the right information at the right times in our business personnel called him and said, hey, I'm a believer, sign me up. And so Bill said, 
Okay, that's great. I appreciate the support. Um, but, you know, elaborate for me. What, what did you see? It's not a huge storm. You shouldn't have seen anything in Florida. And he said, well, essentially, uh, this solar storm just knocked out our satellite communications. And Bill said, really, how, how do you know that? A lot of words here because I'm sensitive about putting satellite companies' information out there. But this is an email they sent to their customers. And the, the, the main point being, they say a solar event created an automatic system safeguard. So this is a Sky Terra 1 satellite, the most expensive communication satellite ever launched. So they originally predicted you know, a couple days of outage. Turns out this outage lasted almost three weeks. And they actually had to move in orbit another communication satellite over to restore satellite communications for that region. So both uh, Florida emergency management was impacted. And this is also, we find out later, um, integral to, to how the power grid communicates in that region of the country. So again, it's very hard for us to guess sometimes to make it that far down the failure chain of how these impacts are going are to show up. And this failure, essentially, the timing on this, trying to get the cursor back here, was really at the peak of that radiation storm. So I think, you know, hard for me to say conclusively what happened. Those are their words, not mine. Uh, but, but certainly, radiation played a role in putting that satellite out for a short period of time. So the geomagnetic storms, we've, we've kind of uh, covered this. But again, these, these um, billion ton clouds of plasma leave the sun at, at anywhere from 1 to 5 million miles an hour. So I mean, it can make that trip uh, you know, 18 hours, 19 hours, you know, up to several days. In general, the faster the storm, the stronger. That's a loose correlation. The other thing that we get to go off of is we get to, to see how bright it is, how much material is there. But essentially, when we, we get that, as I said, that model helps us nail down the arrival time. But really, on intensity forecasting, uh, the forecasters are, are on their own on that long lead time. So we do fairly well with that over the recent performance, I think essentially about two-thirds of the time we're within plus or minus one level on that geomagnetic storm scale from where we said we'd be. Going back to that July event, we would have went all in. It was moving so fast, the, sh the, the best forecast would have been that it's going to be extreme. And we would have been right. Um, I'll show you in a minute the uh, March of 89 storm. We would have uh, been embarrassed by that one, quite frankly. It took about 55 hours for that storm to make its way from sun to earth. So just by the nature of that, we would have put it in that less significant category. So there are going to be surprises in our business. Um, it's just the state of the understanding that we have. But I want to make sure that people understand that so that their expectations are realistic um, for where we really are in our ability to forecast. So again, we put out those watch products, higher level of certainty. And then once it crosses that a spacecraft, the data shown again here, we get that short term warnings. Um, higher confidence warnings uh, to our customers. Key thing, and I'm going to go through examples here, but, but essentially when this CME compresses Earth's own little place in space, it can, it can push it on the, the, the day side and stretch the tail out on the night side. If you think of a comet tail, and think of that tail that, that blows away, essentially it blows away from the sun. That's how they discovered the solar wind. We have the same thing with Earth. And as that really gets stretched, we'll snap that tail off, It'll recoil and essentially pours tons of energy into our ionosphere and atmosphere. And it drives the aurora, for one. And it also um, sets up tremendous currents uh, that can induce currents on long conductors in the ground. So think of oil pipelines, overhead transmission lines. Um, and I'll, I'll step through those in a little more detail. So this is um, an impact essentially representative of, of GPS. So I've got a deal, and I've got to get so many appearances of my drink in the, to get my full commission. But this is one example of an impact um, of what happens to the ionosphere and correspondingly to GPS when we get big geomagnetic storms. So this is the FAA's Wide Area Augmentation System. This is from 2003. They have made improvements since that, since that time. Uh, but this, again, was a big wake-up call on the vulnerabilities of GPS. So I'm going to play a movie here that will essentially show you. So essentially, this is meters of error in the vertical. So you can see the scale to the right there. You know, that blue to yellow transition is 40 meters of vertical error. Once it crosses 50, that yellow to orange transition, it's unusable. So we're way off the top of the scale. That's in excess of 70 meters of vertical error. They no longer can trust GPS well enough 
to use it for dynamic phases of flight. So prior to this, the vision for the next generation of air transportation system had GPS as a cornerstone. That's still true, but they now realize that there are vulnerabilities and that they have to have backup navigational aids uh, for things of this nature. Uh, I'll add one more story, and, and I think it's true, and I'll try to bring this all back together at the end of, okay, a lot of stuff, what do you do with it? What do we tell people? And what really matters to people? And I think the same is true for GPS. So you see that here space weather has caused a huge outage. There was also a test case running at LaGuardia Airport where they were using a new GPS system for, for essentially trying to land aircraft. And they were going through this you know, very detailed test phase, and about twice a day, GPS at the airport would shut down. It would be completely jammed. So they were absolutely, they didn't know if it was someone with, with bad intentions. Uh, they really didn't know, so they had to, to, to start to, to watch that, and they, they finally figured out it was a delivery truck driver who had gone on eBay and bought a GPS jammer for 200 bucks because he didn't want his boss to know where he was. So again, I, I bring it up here to know that uh, with GPS, essentially you have to know when to trust it. You have to have the safeguards in place uh, to when you don't trust it when you shouldn't. Another great example is in Alaska, they plow the uh, Thompson Pass going into Valdez. Tremendous snowfall. Joel can tell us a it's a lot. But anyways, they essentially have to plow it in whiteout conditions. They've, they've developed a system where they literally will drive in whiteout conditions running a fancy system of GPS um, to stay on the road with a you know, thousand foot drop to the right. And if they get too far to the right, they have an audio alarm that goes off, they have lights that flash, and the, the part that I got a kick out of is that the seat on that side starts to vibrate to say you're going too far, and then the same for the other way. But it's systems like that that have, have really grown up in the absence of much for space weather and much for strong geomagnetic storms that people need to be careful with and be aware that you have a sensitivity to know that there are times when you shouldn't trust that to plow Thompson Pass in a whiteout. Now, they very sharp people. They have those safeguards built in. I believe if they, if they can't keep the accuracy within 15 centimeters, they'll shut it off. But it's, it's things that people have to be aware of when to trust those systems. So the piece, and probably the reason I'm standing here, truth be told, is uh, what can this do to the power grid? So again, you see a very nice picture from, I think, the DMSP satellite, where you see the aurora coming down over the most of the United States. Essentially, those are huge current systems. And what they're doing is if you have a long conductor on the ground, and I'm talking you know, 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers, um, it can start to induce currents. We're not talking about effects on this laptop, on my cell phone, for example. These are long conductors that can kind of big antenna to sense these changes. And what happens is it ends up in the transformers on the other ends of those systems. And these are the, not the tiny ones that sit on the telephone poles. These are ones that take up some reasonable fraction of this room you know, tens of millions of dollars of cost. And it, it's really the key ones that, that step up power so it can be transmitted a long ways in the transmission system and then, and then bring it back down to usable voltages for distribution on the other end. And a couple examples here of what can happen. So essentially those transformers, it puts them in funny modes and they start to heat and they can destructively fail. So the uh, storm or a uh, study released a few years ago about what could happen so this graphic, it talked about that 1859 storm. This graphic was done on that 1921 storm, that analysis. And essentially it said, pretty scary, but it said if we had that 1921 to 1859 storm today, you could block out, black out large fractions of the country, four to 10 years for full recovery, and one to two trillion, not billion, trillion dollars worth of damage. And under this scenario, they, they assume that uh, you know, 300 of the key transforms of the grid would be, we would be knocked out. Uh, the scary part for that is there are not a lot of spares in general. And then the lead times for this would be, you know, on the order of, of a year or 18 months. One other exacerbating uh, item is that these are global phenomena. So we're going to be competing with outages in the southern hemisphere. South Africa, for example, saw effects in 2003. Sweden, Europe saw effects in 2003 as well. So if we have this global disaster, and everyone's competing for resources, it's a pretty scary scenario if you shut power off for a long period of time. Um, the good news, I think, in this couple caveats that, that deserve to be mentioned here is that the uh, industry has come back again, NERC, and said, we don't agree in the scenario that you could get that long-term, you know, years-long outage by damaging all those transformers. 
Well, what they did agree is that all these instabilities, they could lose, essentially, um, the ability to control the voltage leading to collapse and cascading collapse of large fractions of the system. The better part of this scenario is not that it, it doesn't happen, it's the fact that it's not sustained. It's once that happens, once that storm is over, you know, they can start to restore and stand systems back up and you don't have so much damage across the system. I wish I could stand here and solve this issue for you. If I could, I'd be a very, very rich man, in fact. But the jury's still out. I think the, the, the good part is that uh, this report kind of forced the issue. It put it on the White House's radar, put it on FEMA, national security staff, um, put it on the radar. The people in the industry, for example, I've heard, you know, they disagree with the size of the dot. They'll say, oh, no, that's not a weak transform for me. My giant orange dot should really be over here. So there's disagreements. But what it has forced is they're going to look at it more closely. A and going just a little bit to the uh, attention this has gotten at the highest levels of government and going back to March, Again, we were, Bill Merton and I were sitting in the op center, busy. When it gets moving, it's just like the, re the rest of the business on the terrestrial side. It's all you can do to keep up. It's all you can do to handle those, those media calls, all you can do to, to handle those calls to customers. And we got a call through our FEMA rep, and they said, uh, hey, what's going on? The president wants to know. He said, president of what? You know, we got stuff to do. And they said, the president of the United States. We said, yes, we'll be right on it. And... Uh, so it actually made it into the presidential daily briefing for that, that series of activity in March. So that's a great thing that it's getting the attention at the government. Um, when this threat matures and the understanding of this threat matures, I think we'll realize that, that it doesn't merit that level of attention unless we're really talking, you know, these extreme storms, these once in a decade, you know, once in 50 year storms, but at least we're getting the attention and the issues getting um, more resources to be, be resolved. So again, a nice reference chart of the uh, myriad of, of impacts uh, across the different systems from space weather. And a lot of these vulnerabilities uh, remain true today. So th the other thing that's challenging for us is that the bar keeps moving. So as I said, GPS is becoming more ingrained. It's in, it's in everything. It's in ATM transactions, you know, financial transactions, literally timed down to the nanosecond. I mean, there's a lot of money at stake and uh, I'm going to walk through some, some emerging areas, some interesting stories, really, of, uh, of where this is going. And I think there are examples in here that will eventually make it into our business, like the agriculture, for example. So that farmer in North Dakota that I'll talk about, there will be a time when they need a plain language product. They need it now. We just don't have it. But to where they need to know that, hey, I'm not going to be able to, to, to let my tractor drive itself tomorrow. But I'll go into that example a little bit more. So again, commercial aviation continues to change. It's a little bit of an old number. I don't have 2012 finals yet, but essentially 11,000 polar flights in 2011, and probably around the same, if not a few more, in 12. So, so what's, what's changing is, is right now they're essentially addressing this issue with the, the loss of HF communication. So when they have a big radiation storm, they come off because of communication reasons. As I said, Iridium will work at the pole. Once they get that, they should be able to fly and maintain communications with Iridium. The next issue that comes up, and it's, in, it's, you know, it's known now that pilots unions are very active, but essentially as that radiation pours into that pole, you're getting elevated radiation exposures in the atmosphere at, at aircraft altitudes, you know, at high latitudes. So radiation is an exceptionally scary word, um, and it, it, it generates a lot of fear. And some of that fear is most certainly founded. There's no doubt about it. But I think what's, what's difficult is people don't know where on that scale of how scared should I be are we. And in general for this, even for, for the commercial space applications I'm going to talk about, what we're really talking about is not the casual passenger who takes that you know, once, a, once a year trip you know, to China, for example. But you start putting a passenger and crew on there every day that fly back and forth and back and forth. And you start to rack up those flight hours and you start to, to creep up out of the noise on some excess fatal cancer risk for life. So I think I saw a great slide. I don't have it in here. But um, the head of the um, Allied Pilots Association um, had a great slide. It was a report from a, a nationally uh, recognized uh, body in radiation protection. They said that air crew are the highest exposed radiation workers, even above nuclear plant workers in the US. So it's an issue that is most certainly uh, going to get a lot more attention. And then again, uh, the GPS, um, GNSS being the broader worldwide term for that, uh, 
being the errors that you can get, you know, knowing when to trust the systems, and then even denial of, of service. So this is a uh, really exciting uh, venture as well. I'll just go quickly through this. Essentially, you see the image credit from Virgin Galactic. We have people essentially doing suborbital. So there's, there's really two categories here. Suborbital means I go straight up. I linger for a little bit, get an awesome view of the world, get to feel weightless for a moment, and then I come back down. So essentially for that, um, you know, you're not spending lots of time up there. So it's radiation is, is most likely not going to be a huge issue for that, just purely based on the short period of time that you're going to spend up there. But I think still um, for repeat flyers, for crew, for example, same as the airlines, um, deserves a close eye. What's really going to push the envelope here is the uh, orbital flight. So amazing picture, the bottom right here. I'm a space nerd. I spent many years in that business doing radiation protection for the astronauts. This is pretty near and dear to my heart. But this is the first commercial return. So this is the SpaceX Dragon ca capsule. And really, to me, representative of a new era in that now people putting things in space and, and the capability to put humans in space um, doesn't lie with you know, the Russian government and the US government and you know, this tiny handful of spacefaring nations around the world, is we're going to open this up to the general public. And I've got a couple sh um, slides that I think tell it better. Um, but we're going to have to start all those radiation issues that the astronauts face. Those are going to start to apply the people that, that stay on the space hotel for a few weeks. These are all issues that are going to come up. So this is a, if this doesn't make your eyes hurt, I don't know what will. But this is a, essentially, again, looking at the Earth, just to try and boil this down for us. So you see it tilted. Um, everybody's heard of Van Allen, the trapped radiation belts. Um, they're out there. They're, they're tough for satellites to fly through. They have to design them appropriately. The space station, for example, luckily flies pretty much below that. You'll see that in the next slide. Uh, but there's a pretty healthy trapped radiation environment. As you start to fly through that, you have to pay attention. So if you take this bottom graph, you see these are kind of shells or think of these as, as a particle can live on this. It'll go around the Earth and go around the Earth, but it can kind of live on this shell. And you can see if you turn this bottom graphic on its side, it goes from you know, 2 to 7. So think of that filling that gap left right here. Essentially, the red is intense radiation. So you can see over you know, that 20-year uh, you know, span, roughly, lots of changes in the radiation. So these are things that most people could, could ignore, only the satellite providers. The, the pointy-headed guys in those dark control rooms, you know, buried in these plots. But it's not going to be that way forever. It's, it's the commercial space flyers going to have to start to pay attention. And, and better to make that point, again, is, is a picture. So this is, it's an old graphic. It's from my, my friends at the NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, this is from the Mir space station. But same, same orbital inclination. How high does it go as, as, a, as a space station we have today? And that's simply because the Baikonur Cosmodrome, where Russia launches, is at that latitude. You can put the most mass in orbit if you launch straight east. So if we had done the space station by ourselves, it would have been down here in Florida at 28 and a half degrees. And you can see that it, um, radiation would have been much less of an issue. So it, was, it, it all depends on the point being where you are, how high you are. And what shows up here is a constant kind of background term that's always there. There's always radiation coming in from space. Um, they're seeing that. And then this, going back to the graphic before, is where you're starting to get into that trapped radiation belt, that Van Allen belt, that inner proton belt. So they fly through this repetitively, and it starts to, to add up on their exposure. So this is the space weather piece of that, and that's essentially a difference image. So we took everything that's there every day. So that South Atlantic anomaly, that, that uh, high-intensity area off the coast of Brazil is gone. That's because it's steady. It's always there. And also that... Uh, galactic cosmic ray contribution, that also, that background term, it's gone too. And what you see now is the addition of that radiation exposure at the high latitudes. So, um, as again, something that only uh, spacefaring nations had to worry about, now applicable, um, you know, to, to commercial space. Again, going to, to GPS, we got an interesting email from a John Deere dealer in the Dakotas, and essentially they said when we get geomagnetic storms on that one, two level of scale, they get about a thousand calls of complaints that people can no longer drive their tractors, let their tractors drive themselves in the most sensitive manner. So all of a sudden, we've, we've seen this technology you know, blossom over the last five years. We get our first few geomagnetic storms, and uh, all of a sudden, we realize we have a vulnerability we didn't really realize about before. So this is also with the, with the power. So as we 
couple images here that um, wind power generation off the coast, for example, as we start to generate power where it's easy to produce and transmit it a long ways uh, to where we, we use it, you know, you start to introduce long transmission lines. And that's the source of the problem, essentially. That's why uh, Quebec, or that uh, Hydro-Quebec, they had an outage in, in March of 1989. So normal operation to complete failure. In 90 seconds, it took 6 million people out of service for, I think they had 80% restored in something like 8 or 9 hours. But they have hydro production in the north, 1,000 kilometers away from where the, the bulk of the need is in Montreal, Quebec City, for example. So those, those long lines, and they sit up on the Aurora, very sensitive to that. The other thing at work is that this is from the, the Three Gorges uh, Dam in China. And uh, these are 1,000 kilovolt lines. So, I mean, we run like 765,000. Now they've gone up to a million volt lines. And so what does that mean? Again, not worth getting into the details, but the higher in voltage you go, in general, the way they have to build those is that they make the resistance on those lines lower, <coughs> which makes them better conductors for those ge geomagnetic storms. So instead of, there are things that uh, we can do to, to be more prepared for this, this threat, and there are certain hardware mitigations you can do, but in general, the system is growing and becoming more complex and, and more at risk. So this is an interesting picture. I was in the UK briefing the uh, UK chief scientific advisor uh, to the prime minister, Sir John Beddington, so I, I googled their paper. And I pulled this out as a, out of London, and it was the uh, first criminal captured that they attributed to an unmanned aer aerial vehicle. So again, just one example of how these things are making their way into so many uses. We got another call in March. It was about a uh, company using UAVs for security on the northern U.S. border, essentially. And it wasn't so much the geomagnetic storm uh, that got them or the GPS, but they have a compass, a little magnetic compass in the nose of their aircraft that they use to fly and make sure the aircraft is upright. And essentially, when we got those big variations in the magnetic field, it showed up on that little compass, and it looked like their aircraft was wobbling around and flying out of the sky. So essentially, they have to ground those aircraft, um, taking those out of service. So lots of vulnerabilities. Again, some of them are hard to see um, you know, before we get into it and start to observe the effects, but, but lots changing, lots to keep up with. So again, the northern lights, several images here. I'm going to go pretty quickly uh, just to, to cover this, but I want you to have it for reference. Some beautiful pictures out of uh, a colleague of mine, uh, out of the, the Weather Service office in Duluth. Um, but, but what's going on? Essentially, these are, as this energy pours back into our atmosphere, we're exciting oxygen and nitrogen, uh, different forms at different altitudes, but then it, it uh, essentially relaxes back to its ground state and emits light. So it's, it's really the most tangible and often beautiful uh, part of the phenomena that we get to work with. So again, those just on the shape of that magnetic field, again, they have easy access at the pole. So this is the, uh, the south pole, for example. But they essentially center themselves on ovals around the magnetic poles again. And as the storm gets stronger, it expands further south. So under extreme cases, going back to the historical records, when we get a good one, you know, once in a decade, you know, it's going to be a neat night for people in Florida to be able to walk outside and look up and see the aurora. So I think that's one way we can reach people in this business. And it's one of the tangibles. So again, here are the details on that. Um, you guys probably know the atmospheric physics and chemistry way better than I do, so I'll spare you of my interpretation. But essentially, different light at different layers, um, you know, creating this. So how do we how do we get information out? And what are we doing? Um, so we do phone contact for our critical stakeholders. So as I said in in 1989 with that blackout in Quebec, the power grid got pretty smart pretty fast about what they need to do. So we're pretty ingrained with how they do business. So we do have phone contact that gets redistributed for com critical stakeholders, like commercial airlines, uh, power, power companies, FEMA, for example. Uh, the one that's available to the general public, and we have subscribers worldwide freely available is an email product subscription service. Um, it's great if you're a GPS user. You know I go in and pick, you know, geomagnetic storms affect GPS. You go in and pick those levels of products. Uh, like that John Deere dealer, for example, he understands that hey, in general, when I get a level two storm, I start to see errors. So then they know I can, I can pay attention at this level. Um, what it doesn't do a great job of and what it isn't easy to navigate is if you're a, coming off the street and you've seen, hey, there's a space weather storm, it's, it's not a great summary for you. It's a little bit, it's more detailed or more angled for the technical user. So what we're trying to do, circled in red, and this is a, 
stopgap, essentially, as we, as we revamp our web page. But we'll try and take, when there's something legitimately interesting to talk about, we'll try and summarize that in a top news. For example, we'll, we'll, we try not to make it too techy, but we still kind of use that R, S, and G scale. So we, it's, it's a bit uh, of a stretch. We have to ask some people who want to understand it. As you've heard today, there's lots of phenomena with lots of impacts. We have to ask them to come a little bit of the way, but we try to keep it as, as plain language as, as we can. So that's, that's what we have today. And then the website, so we like to uh, say that we were one of the first 2,000 websites on the Internet. What we don't like to say is we still look like we're one of the first 2,000. So we recognize that. It was originally set up to essentially serve up data. Worked very well for that. Um, but as we get you know, people more aware and they see it on TV, they want to know it isn't serving that need very well. So we're under a major overhaul. We'll get kind of nice stories up there with a nice picture, a nice summary for people. And I think when it's going to be of interest to the general population, that's going to be where we're going to get that message out. Again, Facebook. Facebook, a little bit different philosophy in that we always keep something out there. We keep educational things mixed in. Um, and then when we have high activity, we also change gears on Facebook to put that in. And then active media support during events. So we found with the interest we get overwhelmed, we'll set up big teleconferences, but we still certainly support one-on-one -on -one interviews and, and from, for major media outlets. So we, you can get with me afterwards if you want more information about that. Again, more of a slide here for reference, online resources from NOAA. Our partners across the federal government also have a great deal of resources out there. Near-term changes to the website, as I said. We're also trying to change our forecast just very quickly. Um, we have two new products out there for evaluation right now. One of them is a one-pager. It takes that R scale, that S scale, and a G scale, and it puts the forecast probabilities in one page in plain language. So one of the complaints, and it was very legitimate, was that it was too confusing to tease that out of our other products. Couldn't agree more, so we've tried to fix that. We've also gone to the other end of the spectrum, and we have a discussion to where we go into the nitty-gritty details of, w of what we expect. So the, uh, we're going to continue to improve these models. Um, one of the ones I want to point out is the bottom bullet there. It's that auroral model. So this is not the sexiest of graphics ever, but the point I wanted to make here is that this is in AWIPS, essentially. So we're trying to get this in a format that other people can ingest. So standalone, it's interesting, but it'll be that much better when you can layer that with a cloud cover model and tell someone, can I really see the aurora from my house or can I not? You know, it is, it is a test product. There are a couple limitations that we're fixing this fiscal year. Uh, one being the fact that it was lacking enough statistics to, to when we get the big, big storm, it's going to put it over most of the U.S. It, it didn't uh, show it going that far south. We funded the uh, developer at Johns Hopkins to extend that model. So we've got that change made. Now we're really working on getting it operational. But I can get you the experimental link on that. So I, I will leave this with you if I could... Just have one slide for you, just to summarize the, the radio blackouts. So no advance warning, um, affects tens of minutes to several hours, high frequency impacts on the day side, and really it's our first heads up. We could get more activity. Radiation storm scale again can stay elevated for several days. It affects satellites, astronauts in space, and then also HF in the polar regions. And then the last one, the geomagnetic storms, we do get some lead time because we get to observe that, watch it make that transit. Um, but impacts to power systems, GPS use, and then the driver of the aurora. So if we get that severe to extreme, you're going to be able to see aurora most over most of the lower 48. So it's going to be a, although I'll be nestled in the office on the phone, I'm going to take a peek outside myself. It's the, the coolest way. Some of this is so intangible, but a good way to visualize that. So there we are in Boulder, and I will leave it at that and uh, certainly open it up for questions. Thank, thank you very much. So we, we do have a few minutes for uh, a couple of questions. If anybody has them, I just wanted to uh, ask you to use the microphones. Uh, uh, Craig, there's one there. and um, So we can pass those around. We do have a couple of questions here. And I do also just want to remind everybody that the presentations, the PowerPoints, and the videos will be put online uh, at the agenda page. So if you go to the website and click on agenda, you'll see them start to populate as each of the presentations finishes. So these first ones today will be up in probably an hour or so. The videos will be up uh, by this time tomorrow, most likely. So uh, let's kick off some questions. Please identify yourself. Matt Safino from KGW in Portland. Um, what happened with that uh, Air Canada flight from Vancouver to Tokyo? W was it really at risk? And what does INSERFA stand for? So INSERFA essentially says 
it's very odd acronyms that they use pieces of words, but essentially it says there's uncertainty to the health and safety of that aircraft. So there are three phases of that. The first one is essentially we have some doubt. The second one is kind of one notch up from that. And then that third phase is really we think we've lost an aircraft. So essentially with that, no major impacts. As long as they know what's going on and the ground controllers know that there's a good reason we can't reach that aircraft, all is well. Th there are other workarounds they can try and reach that aircraft by relaying messages aircraft to aircraft, for example, which is essentially what they did. What happened in that case is you're required to report your position and the health of your aircraft essentially every 30 minutes. They'd pass that window and been unable to make a report for that time period. So, so essentially, as long as they, they know what, it's, what the driver is, um, they can mitigate the impact. Yes, sir. Jim White, University of Colorado. Um, a comment. Uh, the, um, I work in the polar regions, and we've lost communications frequently because of all the issues we talked about. I would say that there's a lot of, of um, activity now that the Arctic is warming up. Uh, there are oil platforms out there. There are ships out there. There's a lot of ground uh, people in need of communication. So it's it's you know while while you're you know you, you mentioned the airplanes and I think that is important. Right. There's a lot more going on now in the Arctic, and a lot of it is still running off old HF communication. It's you know some iridium, but iridium's expensive. Yeah. As someone who's paid for iridium, yeah. um, a question for you. And this may be outside of your the, the realm of what you do, but. Um, we hear a lot about the aging infrastructure of our energy system. And um, I can just sort of imagine that this system going down, and then they try to turn it on and the whole thing fails. Right. Um, do, you, do you guys get into that? Or you just you forecast this is going to happen, and then you know, let, let the crap hit the fan you know, somewhere down yeah. the road? Or well, it, it is a little bit out of our purview, but uh, we try to describe what's going to happen to the environment. But, but that said, um, I'm an electrical engineer by myself. I waited to the end to tell you that. If you figured out it wasn't a meteorologist, I didn't want to get kicked out. But um, I sit in those meetings, and I hear the concerns. And essentially, with the power grid, a lot of these transformers, for example, very big capital investments. And so you know, there are some that are 40 years old. And so as they're turning that infrastructure over, they're replacing them with designs that they believe are less vulnerable, for example, to these geomagnetically induced currents, if it's applicable, if you're in a region of risk. So yeah, I mean, there is turnover. Um, but they're getting pretty sharp about it. So there, there are things going on. I didn't get into it, but across the uh, regulatory half of the government within energy, uh, there's a notice of pr proposed rulemaking, they call it. So essentially, regulation is coming to say, what do you have to do to, to prove that you're, um, let me back up. Regulation could be coming to, for, for um, people in the generation and distribution community to prove that you've done enough to, to show that you're not at, at risk for uh, infrastructure collapse. And I do want to go back. Um, yeah, I wish I could, I could go on all day. If, but uh, in the Arctic, for example, GPS. So all those things still apply for GPS. So you, if you talk about deep sea drilling and you've got a ship bits in 1,000 feet of water and then you know, the seafloor below it, and you're trying to hold that ship within two meters, you start you know, throwing GPS errors, largely done by GPS. You start throwing these these huge GPS errors on that. And those users have to know, tomorrow's going to be a bad day to try and keep that ship steady over that bit. And the last thing that, that anybody wants to see in the Arctic is, is a disaster. And God forbid, you know, space weather either cause a disaster based on a GPS error or exacerbate uh, disaster recovery you know, based on impacts to communications, for example. You know, not being able to remote reach a remote village in a with HF. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Active work in the Alaska region for us. Great. Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Bob. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. <clears throat>